Hey guys, welcome back to or welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, my name is Cheyenne Auction. And if you have, thank you so much for watching my videos and supporting me. You guys have no idea how much it means to me. You're really making my dreams come true. In today's video, I will be covering the case of a lesser known Australian serial killer by the name of John Wayne Glover. Or as he's better known, the Granny Killer. Like most of my true crime videos, this is a extremely loaded and heartbreaking case. And I will do a quick disclaimer, this video does heavily talk about murder, assault, suicide, suicide attempts, and it also heavily talks about sexual assault. So if you feel you are negatively impacted by any of this, I will recommend clicking off the video now before I start talking about the case more. The Granny Killer is an Australian serial killer whose reign of terror lasted from 1989 to 1990. This was the nickname that was given to the unnamed killer, the unidentified killer at that point in time. He was, however, identified as John Wayne Glover and he was actually 56 at the time of the murders and his murder spree claimed the lives of six elderly women between the ages of 60 and 93. The serial killing took place in a couple of suburbs in Sydney's North Shore and John Wayne Glover's official number of victims is six. However, there was a lot of public speculation that he could have killed many as 13 people and these are people that he later went on to kind of claim that he murdered or that could be somewhat linked back to him. John Wayne Glover was born on the 26th of November 1932 in Wolverhampton, England, United Kingdom to a working class family. John Wayne Glover passed away on the 9th of September 2005 and his cause of death was from suicide by hanging in his prison cell. At this point in time, he was 72 years old and he was serving his time in Lithgow Correctional Centre in Lithgow, New South Wales when he committed suicide. While John Wayne Glover was in England, he actually decided to join the army but he was kicked out when his numerous crimes in England finally came to light. John Wayne Glover was convicted of numerous petty crimes such as shoplifting clothing items and handbags. And this is like many serial killers, there is a pattern in their crime, kind of like an escalation over time, where their crime progressively get worse. This can be seen with the Gone State Killer, Adam Lott and many more, and Don Wayne Glover is one of those serial killers. In most cases where serial killers are looked at more closely, a large number of them seem to follow kind of a certain pattern where they will start off with robberies, then start going into sexual and physical assault before moving into murders. And because of this progression in crime that happens in the majority of serial killers, it kind of looks seems like to most people that it is related to the fact that it's either to do with the thrill they get from committing crime, it's like a high to them, they need a bigger one each time, or it is related to the fact that they get bored and they feel invincible, they feel like they will never get caught because they haven't before and they get bored and become way more brutal. And part of that can be the fact that they love that people are terrified. They love that they can control that fear over people. In 1956, John Wayne Glover em emigrated from England to Australia and he actually ended up in Melbourne at first. During the 1960s, which was shortly after John Wayne Glover emigrated to Australia, he was 24 years old at the time and John Wayne Glover was convicted on two counts of larceny, which is the legal term for a generally non-violent theft. He was convicted of these two crimes in Victoria and also a stealing charge in New South Wales. In 1962, John Wayne Glover was convicted of two counts of assaulting women in Melbourne, 
two counts of indecent assault, one of assault um, occasioning actual bodily harm, and two more counts of larceny. For this, the slap on the wrist punishment he got was only a three year good behaviour bond, which is really fucking pathetic because he, these attacks were brutal, and I will talk about that in a second. And when I say brutal, these attacks were brutal and savage and three years is not enough of a fucking punishment. I feel he should have been getting at least 20 years prison time at that point and it might have saved a lot more lives and prevented a lot of murder victims and assault victims of his. Each of these attacks that John Wayne Glover made against women were absolutely brutal and in all of these cases certain clothing items had been removed from the victims and all of John Wayne Glover's victims were forced to the ground as he ruthlessly tore their clothing. One of John Wayne Glover's victims was actually a 25 year old woman who was on her way home after a meeting at 10.30 p.m. He followed this 25 year old woman and chased her down a dark suburban street and then he knocked her out cold. When she came to she realised that she was in a garden and that she was bleeding profusely and she also noticed that her undergarments were in a disarray. The young woman started screaming and crying for help and when it finally caught the attention of other residents in the area. John Wayne Glover made a run for it before he could actually assault her any further. During the time of this attack, he was actually living in a suburb of Melbourne called Camberwell and he was actually a television rigger for the ABC. This was before he travelled up to Sydney after getting married. When he was in Sydney, he moved into his parent-in-law's house in 1968. They lived in a suburb called Mothman and he never seemed to have had a good relationship with his mother or his mother-in-law. And in fact, he seemed to have extremely troubled relationships with all of the older women who were in his life. Most people know him as John Wayne Glover or the Granny Killer, but he also had another nickname which is the Monster of Mothman, which pretty fucking fitting. John Wayne Glover was a pie salesman and he actually really used this job to his advantage to gain access to elderly women. But these women weren't to be his murder victims um, and I will talk about that a bit more later on in the video. Back before John Wayne Glover had started his serial killings in the late 1980s, he was actually a volunteer at the Senior Citizen Society and he was pretty well known to a lot of people as an extremely friendly, trustworthy and just an overall normally family man. He was a sales representative at 4 and 20 Pies. He was married, had two children and he lived a pretty good and normal life in Mothman. That is how it seemed to people from the outside though. He and his wife had been married for 20 years at that point and she had absolutely no idea about his previous adventures and running with the law in Australia and in England. She didn't know how many things he had been charged with in the past and that he had a criminal record. She didn't know that he had been convicted of petty crimes in England and pretty serious crimes in Australia and she probably didn't even know that he would actually kicked out of the British Army because of the petty crimes in England. On the 11th of January 1989, John Wayne Glover physically assaulted 84 year old Margaret Todd Hunter. At the time she was walking down Hale Road in Mothman and when he spotted Margaret he parked his car, walked right up to her and punched her in the face. After he punched Margaret Todd Hunter in the face, he then stole everything that was in her purse including $209, which he then spent at the Mothman RSL club on the poker machine. 
On the 1st of March 1989, the granny killer struck for the first time and the first victim to fall to the hands of John Wayne Glover was Gwendolyn Mitchell Hill and Gwendolyn was 82 years old at the time. Gwendolyn Mitchell Hill was beaten to death with a hammer and this was at the entry to her Mothman unit on Military Road. John Wayne Glover had seen her walking and he walked back to his car, grabbed a claw hammer, hid it under his belt and then came up behind Gwendolyn Mitchell Hill as she went to open her front door and he struck her on the back of the head. After this initial strike, John Wayne Glover continued to hit her multiple times on her head and the rest of her body and he then fled the scene with a purse which contained $100. She had several broken ribs and was actually still alive when she was found by two schoolboys and unfortunately she passed away when police and ambulance arrived at the scene. There were no witnesses to the attack even though it happened in broad daylight and at first neighbours really believed that Gwendolyn had just fallen. At first um, investigators noticed that her purse was missing and initially assumed that this was just a mugging gone wrong. However, sadly, they were wrong about this and this was the beginning of a series of killings. Police started noticing a pattern when on the 9th of May 1989, Lady Ashton, whose full name was Lady Winfreda Isabel Hoggard Ashton was found. Lady Ashton was the second wife and widow to a really famous Australian landscape painter, Sir John William Ashton. Lady Ashton was 84 years old when she was murdered by John Wayne Glover and she was found in the bin alcove of her apartment. John Wayne Glover was walking down Military Road when he first saw Lady Ashton and she was actually headed home to her house on Raglan Street and when he noticed her he started following her and he put on a pair of gloves and followed her into the foyer of her apartment. It was then that he struck Lady Ashton with a claw hammer and after hitting her, John Wayne Glover then threw Lady Ashton to the ground and dragged her to the bin alcove where she was later found. When John Wayne Glover got Lady Ashton to the bin alcove, he repeatedly hit her head against the pavement and later on he revealed that Lady Ashton had almost overpowered him until he fell on her and repeatedly smacked her head against the pavement. When Lady Ashton was unconscious, John Wayne Glover then removed her pantyhose and proceeded to strangle her with them. And at the time, Lady Ashton actually had her walking stick with her and John Wayne Glover placed his walking stick next to her body really neatly and then proceeded to take her shoes off and place those neatly next to her feet. Like with his other victims, he had stolen her purse which had $100 in it and spent that money at the Mothman RSL Club where he made an extremely strange comment to people who were working at the time. At the time, staff reported that he said when he heard a siren outside that he hoped that the siren weren't for another mugging victim. When police arrived at the scene, they noticed that Lady Ashton was face down on the ground, laying diagonally against the pavement. Police noticed that there was a pool of blood underneath her head and they noticed that her pantyhose was tied tightly around her neck, so tightly that they ended up cutting through the skin. They also noticed that her bare legs were crossed and that her arms were straight by her side. She also had a thin trickle of blood running out of her mouth and it was at this point that police became convinced that they were dealing with a serial killer. A serial killer whose victims so far had been pretty wealthy elderly women that had all either been killed or assaulted before being robbed. They also became very concerned that the serial killer was only targeting the Mothman area before he started targeting some other areas. 
during a post-mortem examination, um, they tested Lady Ashton's body for semen, as strangulation is really common in a lot of cases of rape, but they found none, and the mark around her neck was measured at 9 centimeters. She had bruises on her neck, nose, um, her temple, and her eyelids, and they also discovered that at some point during the struggle, Lady Ashton had bit her lip, and this had caused some damage to the inner lining of her mouth. It was also discovered that she had a small mark on her cheek, which actually turned out to be a small cut with a semi-circular abrasion a couple centimetres away from it. The medical examiner noted that Lady Ashton's diamond ring was still on, and that strongly suggested that she hadn't been killed for money. On the 6th of June 1989, 77-year-old Marjorie Mosley, I think, um, who was at the Wesley Gardens retirement home at the time, was molested by John Wayne Glover. Marjorie had reported to staff members at the hospital and to police officers that a man had put his hand up her nightgown, but she couldn't remember what this man looked like. On the 24th of June 1989, John Wayne Glover molested two more elderly women who were patients at the Caroline Chisholm nursing home. The first victim, he lifted her nightgown and proceeded to fondle her buttocks. The second victim was actually in a neighbouring room and he slid his hand down her nightgown and proceeded to um, stroke her breast before she started screaming out for help. This led to John Wayne Glover being questioned by staff members at the hospital before he very quickly left. On the 8th of August 1989, John Wayne Glover molested another elderly woman whose name was Effie Carney and he assaulted her in a back street in Linfield, which is in Sydney's Upper North Shore. On the 6th of October 1989, John Wayne Glover pretended to be a doctor at the Y. Benia nursing home. This nursing home is located in the suburb of Neutral Bay in the lower area of Sydney North Shore. During this time is when he ran his hands up the dress of patient Phyllis McNeil and he left as soon as Phyllis, who was blind, started calling out for help. At this point in time, no one has suspected or even identified John Wayne Glover as responsible for the hospital molestation. On the 18th of October 1989, John Wayne Glover attacked 86-year-old Doris Cox, who was a widow along Fit Road in Mothman. He followed her into her retirement village and into a secluded staircase in the front of the house where he attacked her. John Wayne Glover smashed her into a brick wall where she then fell. Amazingly, Doris Cox survived the assault, but she could not provide an accurate description of her attacker as things had happened so quickly and police thought it was also because she had dementia. She did say that her attacker could possibly be a younger man, possibly a teenager or a skateboarder, and she did provide police with an identity sketch. On the 2nd of November 1989, John Wayne Glover came across um, Dorothy Banky Banks, I don't know how to say her last name, and she was a resident to Lane Cub and he actually helped her. He found her while she was walking home on a back street just off Langville Road and this is actually about 10 kilometres away from Mothman. He saw her struggling home with bags of shopping and actually offered to carry them for her, but she declined at first. However, he was pretty persistent and she soon took him up on his offer. And because when they got to her house, she was really grateful for the help, she invited him in and offered him a cuppa as a thanks, but he declined and left. It was after helping Dorothy Banky Banks um, when he was headed back down the lane road that he 
spotted another elderly woman. This elderly woman was struggling with groceries at the time and instead of helping her, he instead assaulted and murdered her. This woman was 85 year old widow Margaret Pahad and she was struck from behind with a blunt object to the head and when she clapped he struck her again. This time when he struck her, he struck her on the side of the head. He then rearranged her clothes, shoes and her walking stick. He obviously took her purse and left the scene as quickly as possible and sadly like the other assaults and murders there were no eyewitnesses. However, sadly, it would be a really young schoolgirl who would find Margaret a couple minutes later. At first, the young schoolgirl thought that someone had just thrown a bunch of clothes out into the laneway before the horrific realisation hit her that she had just stumbled across a body. As police headed to the crime scene, John Wayne Glover was on the ground of a nearby golf club and he rummaged through the purse, found $300, and he then went to the Mothman RSL club where he spent the money. On the 3rd of November 1989, within 24 hours of murdering Margaret Pahud, um, John Wayne Glover brutally murdered Olive Cleveland. Olive Cleveland was the fourth victim of a serial killer now becoming known as the Granny Killer. She was 81 years old when she was murdered by John Wayne Glover. Olive Cleveland was out the front of the Wesley Gardens retirement village where she was living and she was sitting on a bench when John Wayne Glover sat down next to her and started up a conversation with her. Olive started to feel uncomfortable and stood up and went to leave and head toward the main building when John Wayne Glover grabbed her from behind forced her down a ramp and into a secluded side lane. This is when he hit her and repeatedly hit her head against the concrete before taking her pantyhose off and tying them tightly around her neck. This is when he rearranged her clothes, her shoes and her walking stick. He then rummaged through her purse, took the $60 she had and left the scene. Most people at first thought that this was just an extremely bad fall and because again there were no eyewitnesses to say any different, sadly police soon figured out that Olive had sadly fallen victim to the granny killer. This is when the state government doubled the, their reward money on the granny killer's head to $200,000. Well, not his head but to information leading to him and leading to an arrest. On the 23rd of November 1989, John Wayne Glover was at the Biano Vista Hotel in Middlehead Road, Mothman, where he spotted a elderly woman across the road. This woman was 93-year-old Muriel Falconer, who was a widow. When John Wayne Glover spotted Muriel, he went out to his car, which he had parked opposite to the police station, and he grabbed his claw hammer and his gloves, and he followed Muriel Falconer to her house on Mustin Street. This is when he snuck up behind Muriel, who was partially blind and deaf, and he struck her from behind. He placed his hand over Muriel's mouth so that she wouldn't be able to cry for help as he repeatedly was striking her over the head and the neck. When Muriel Falconer had fallen to the ground unconscious, John Wayne Glover began to take her pantyhose off, but she started regaining consciousness as he was doing this and had just enough time to scream for help. Because of this, John Wayne Glover repeatedly struck her over the head with his hammer again until she once again passed out. John Wayne Glover then removed her undergarments and used them to strangle her. He then searched her purse and her house before leaving with a hundred dollars. Again before leaving the crime scene he rearranged Muriel Falconer's shoes. Muriel Falconer was found the very next day by a concerned neighbour who entered the house using a spare key. 
and as soon as she found Muriel, she ran police straight away. Luckily for police, as the crime scene had not been worked down, as it had not been walked through, it meant that the crime scene was still intact and could be used to gather forensic evidence to use to finally catch the serial killer. The interesting thing is, is that all of the other crime scenes were in fact cleaned and this was not done by John Wayne Glover, it was done by neighbours and other residents to the area of the victim who really did have good intentions. They cleaned and hosed down the scenes while believing that these were just horrific accidental falls and by the time that the victim's deaths were um, ruled as a homicide, all of the evidence would unknowingly be gone. But because they had a fully intact crime scene, they used it fully to their advantage. At the crime scene, they found a bloody shoe print and they were actually able to start honing in on a suspect based on a neighbor's description. The neighbor's description of the suspect was that he was a middle-aged, portly man with gray hair. My Christmas day of 1989, the reward money was once again up to $250,000. On the 11th of January 1990, John Wayne Glover, while on his prize sales run, was visited the Greenwich Hospital on River Road, Greenwich. It was here that John Wayne Glover entered the palliative care unit, which at the time housed four elderly and ill women. At the time, John Wayne Glover was dressed up in his work uniform and had a clipboard on him. When he entered the palliative care unit, that was when he came across Daisy Roberts, who was 82 years old and an advanced cancer patient. When John Wayne Glover saw Daisy Roberts, it was then that he asked her if she was losing body heat. He then proceeded to pull up her nightgown and begin to touch her indecently. Daisy Roberts immediately panicked and began calling out for help, which led to a sister at the hospital rushing into the room and finding John Wayne Glover. When the sister confronted John Wayne Glover, he then ran from the hospital. And luckily for police, the sister was able to record his um, car registration number and then she called police and gave them a pretty damn good and accurate description of John Wayne Glover. This would prove to be his fatal mistake. Other staff members at the hospital were able to positively identify and name John Wayne Glover as he was pretty well known around the hospital for his job as the pie salesman and because he was there pretty often. The police returned a week later, this time with a photograph of John Wayne Glover. This is when the sister, whose name was Sister Davis, and Daisy Roberts were able to positively identify John Wayne Glover as the culprit. This would be the police's biggest breakthrough in this case. However, they hadn't they were not considering John Wayne Glover as the granny killer because at this point in time the hospital assault hadn't yet been linked to the murders. It would be three weeks before the task force that was dealing with the murders would be notified about John Wayne Glover and the hospital assaults. The Chatswood Police Department did contact John Wayne Glover's workplace and confirmed that he was indeed an employee of uh, 4 and 20 Pies and they they confirmed his name. It was then that the police department contacted John Wayne Glover and asked him to come in for a formal police interview the very next day about the hospital assaults. John Wayne Glover never showed up for his police interview and this prompted police to call his house where they were informed by John Wayne Glover's wife that he had been hospitalized for a suicide attempt by overdose and that he was currently um, recovering in the um, Royal North Shore Hospital. Police decided to pay him a visit while he was in hospital 
and this is when he actually declined and refused to be interviewed, but surprisingly, he agreed to be photographed. After this, police were handed a note by staff members at the hospital, and the note was written on business paper from 4 and 20 pies. The note said, no more grannies, granny. And he also put something else really interesting on that note. He put Essie started it, and Essie is actually his mother-in-law. Again, it would be another two weeks before the task force, who was working tirelessly at this point to find the serial killer and put him behind bars, it would be two weeks before they would be notified or handed the photo of John Wayne Glover, the note that he had written, and to also be informed about his suicide attempt. The majority of the detectives that were working the case of the granny killer believed instantly that John Wayne Glover was their killer. However, they didn't have enough evidence yet to prove that. This is what the main detective had to say. If he had said to us, I don't want to talk, we couldn't have proven a thing. Do the photos match the descriptions of a grey-haired suspect? And in his job as a pie salesman, Glover could have been at any of the murder scenes. John Wayne Glover was interviewed about all of the hospital assault, where he, not surprisingly, denied all of the accusations being made against him. This is when police decided that because he was denying everything, and because they didn't have enough evidence yet, that they would not question him about the murder check yet. This would have let him know that the police were becoming suspicious of him and that he was becoming their number one suspect in the murders. Police then placed him under constant police surveillance and at one point they even were using an automatic tracking device on him. John Wayne Glover was becoming increasingly paranoid and was living in fear of being followed by police that it made him do more than one lap around the block and occasionally he would drive the wrong way down one-way streets to make sure that he wasn't being followed. On the 19th of March 1990, John Wayne Glover would kill his last known victim. Joan Sinclair became the sixth and final known victim of the granny killer. This time it was a personal murder. The other victims he hadn't known but he, he knew Joan Sinclair pretty well. They were friends, and at the time of her murder, Joan Sinclair was 60 years old and was divorced. From the outside, the pair had a really easy going and a really platonic relationship, and Joan Sinclair was sadly murdered in her house in Beauty Point, Mothman. Because at this time, John Wayne Glover was under constant police surveillance, they watched as Joan Sinclair let John Wayne Glover into her house. This was at 10 a.m. and by 1 p.m. police started getting a little bit worried as John Wayne Glover hadn't left yet, but it was really by 5 p.m. that they became extremely concerned because they had not seen any movement from inside of the house. And it would be at 6 p.m. that they were finally granted permission to enter the premises. At 6pm, two uniformed police officers knocked on the front door and they were using the guise of um, checking on barking dogs. However, they were worried when there was no answer at the front door and checked the premises and they noticed through a rear glass door that there was a claw hammer laying on the ground that was in a pool of dried blood. This is when four detectives entered the crime scene and almost immediately they saw Joan Sinclair's battered head wrapped in a towel and they also saw that her pantyhose had been removed and was tightly tied around her neck. They also sadly discovered that Joan Sinclair's genitals had been really severely damaged but later on John Wayne Glover denied ever raping her or causing the damages. After they found Joan Sinclair's body, they noticed that John Wayne Glover was nowhere in sight, so immediately they start checking the rest of the house because they have a murder suspect 
and a brutal killer on the loose. And they also knew that there was no way that he could have left the house without being seen. Pretty quickly, police found John Wayne Glover laying in Joan Sinclair's bathtub unconscious and that the bathtub was actually filled up. Later on, John Wayne Glover would confess to police or tell police that he and Joan Sinclair had actually been having a relationship for a while. This is alleged, I just want to put that out there. And he also confessed to killing Joan Sinclair. He said that he entered the house, he talked for a little while, and then he hit her across the back of the head with the claw hammer multiple times before taking off her pantyhose and tying them around her neck. He then said that he had wrapped um, Joan Sinclair's body up in a mat and that he had used four towels and wrapped them around her head to try and stop the bleeding. And he then said that he dragged her body across the floor, which actually did leave a trail of blood. John Wayne Glover then claimed that after this, he ran the bath and consumed a handful of Valium and a bottle of B69. After doing this, he slashed his left wrist and laid down in the bathtub waiting to die. And police were actually really happy that he had survived the suicide attempt because they felt that if he died, they would be left to deal with the ongoing speculation of whether or not um, John Wayne Glover was actually the serial killer. On the 28th of March 1990, John Wayne Glover's trial began. John Wayne Glover pleaded not guilty to all of his crimes on grounds of diminished responsibility. During the trial, a psychiatrist did come out and say that John Wayne Glover had a hostility and an anger um, towards his mother since childhood and towards his mother-in-law who was said to be a trigger to him. The psychiatrist said that once she died, John Wayne Glover needed someone to take his anger out on. During the trial, a psychiatrist did say that John Wayne Glover was sane during the time of these murders. And when they studied the case, they said that the case was really strange and unusual as there were very few mass murders and perpetrators are normally mentally ill and they have an organic disease of, to the brain. The Crown Prosecutor maintained that John Wayne Glover was well aware of his action, so aware of his action that he had even planned what he was going to do with the victim's money. The Crown Prosecutor even mentioned during trial that John Wayne Glover even took the time to clean the claw hammer in acid. John Wayne Glover was impotent and had no interest in sex. This meant that removing his victim's pantyhose and tying them around their necks had no meaning sexually. This was solely to make sure that the victims were dead and to make each attack look like it had actually been sexually motivated. It then came to light that John Wayne Glover was addicted to poker machines and that the quickest way to get money for them was by stealing. It took the jury only two and a half hours to come back with the guilty verdict and Justice Wood even said that he was dealing with an extremely dangerous prisoner. John Wayne Glover was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole and this is what Justice Wood had to say. He is able to choose when to attack and when to stay his hand. He is cunning and able to cover his tracks. It is plain that he had chosen his moments carefully, although the crimes have been opp opportunistic. He had not gone in where the risks were overwhelming. The period since January 1989 had been one of intense and serious crime involving extreme violence inflicted on elderly women accompanied by theft or robbery of their property. On any view, the, the prisoner had shown himself to be a, an exceedingly dangerous person and that view was mirrored by the opinions of the psychiatrist who gave evidence at his trial. I have no alternative other than to impose the maximum available sentence, which means that the prisoner will be required to spend the remainder of his natural life in jail. 
It is inappropriate to express any date as to release on parole, having regard for those life sentences. This is not a case where the prisoner may ever be released pursuant to order of this court. He is to never be released. Three days before John Wayne Glover committed suicide on the 9th of September 2005, he actually handed a sketch to an outside visitor and the sketch was of a park that would had a lot of changes to it and it became known as the confession sketch. This sketch contained two palm trees that were pointed out by John Wayne Glover and in the middle of the right one, the number 9 can be seen. This is said to either be his real number of victims or either the amount of unsolved murders he could be responsible for. At one point, he was even considered to be a suspect in the murder of Florence Broadhurst. Anyways, that is all for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed it and learned something new from this video. And I will have all of my sources linked down below if you want to check them out yourself. So that you can get all of the information I barely scratched the surface in this video. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!